And so tonight, our afternoon, we're delighted to have Joe Lawson and Judge Anderson explore the right to Washington Congressman, Hubert H. Peavy, and both Joe and John are from the area. It's been born and raised here in this area. They promote Washington, and they love Washington, so um, uh, it's, uh, it's so, so just, uh, um, so, so just welcome them here, and I uh, uh, hope that you uh, enjoy the thing tonight. And I say this with all sincerity. 
lived on a farm until his teens when, according to his congressional biography, which is supposed to be accurate, but we have to remember the times. His congressional, oh, next slide, please. His congressional biography says that he went to Redwood Falls, Minnesota High School and to the Pillsbury Military Academy uh, in Otomwa, uh, Minnesota. Well, he may have, but he may not have. It may have been the kind of puffery, and John can tell you what puffery is from a legal standpoint. It's inflating our resumes. He may have inflated his congressional resume because the Historical Society from Montana, Iowa, which has all of the records of the Pillsbury Military Academy, has no record whatsoever of the congressman attending or graduating from the, the Military Academy. Now, I do not, I do not, I do not say that that's a definitive statement. I just point out that there were some instances where what has been written down is not always in sync with some of the other stories that were written about and a person who really represents a unique and outstanding uh, representative of the city of Wisconsin, a man of Washington. So after his schooling, and here's where the Haskell name first comes into play. After his schooling, he worked for his uncle, the founder of Beatrice Creamery. Beatrice Creamery turned into Beatrice Foods. Beatrice Foods was sold in the 1980s to Well, there weren't many roads, 
in northern Wisconsin. Most people in 1910 went to Ashland by ferry boat. Uh, and what roads there were went through the swamp over by Fish Creek. Well, so Petey and his group had to leave the vehicle in Ashland and had to come to Washington by boat. And it took them a couple of weeks before they actually were able to bring the car into the city of Washington. Next slide. Now, his wife, she had her own kind of reputation. She was the daughter of the mayor of Otumwa, Iowa, maybe named Glee. And some of the records show that she was an accomplished musician. And she may have taught piano. I have to say may, because it's not um, absolutely established. She may have taught piano at the same academy that PV said that he attended, and he may well have attended that. Um, uh, the interesting thing is, is that there is some evidence that she actually graduated from the Pillsbury Academy, and if she did, it would have been 1903, and it is very likely, if that happened, that she was the first female in the United States to have graduated from any high school or college military academy in the United States. So um, uh, there is so, some recognition there of someone who was, in her own way, an exceptional person. Next slide. Here's a picture of Hubert and Ella from about 1930, um, uh, since it comes from the Washington Times, and you have to pick those out of the microfilm, you get a nice, clear picture like that uh, for the display. Next. The Pinkies moved to Washington in 1910. Why did they pick Washington? There was nothing there's nothing in the record that suggests that he had a strong tie to Washington, Wisconsin. Ottumwa, Minnesota, Washington, Wisconsin? They did know it. And when he came, he came to sell real estate. And one of the first ads that he put in the Washington Times was a quarter-page ad that said that he had 25,000 acres of Bayfield County to sell to anyone who wanted to go into farming. Where, even in 1910, the capital to acquire 25,000 acres of Bayfield County was not something that everyone had in their pocket let alone uh, a real estate salesman from Otomo, Iowa. Well, he wasn't here more than a year, but he became an auto person. So he obviously was charismatic um, uh, and was uh, easily impressed or uh, was able to impress the citizens of Washington. And he wasn't here more than another year and a half, and he became the mayor of Washington. 1914, he's now the mayor of Washington, and Washington is suffering through one of its troughs in its boom and bust cycle. 1915, he buys the other newspaper in Washington, the Idolizer News. He becomes a competitor of the Washington Times. The Washington Times, the newspaper that sang the praises of Washington as the next, next Buffalo of New York, with granaries and iron mills and steamboats up and down and at the harbor and all those kind of things. And he was kind of the, the antagonist poking them in the side, so they developed a lesson an amicable relationship. Well, by 
1914, he tired of being the mayor. In 1913, and he was elected to the Wisconsin legislature. And he spent two years in the Wisconsin legislature and wasn't particularly enamored with the experience of being in Madison when he took a whole day by train to get as far as Green Day. Uh, so he came back, and it was now 1915 and 1916, and Europe was on the minds of a lot of people, and the Wisconsin legislature passed a naval militia bill. And cities along Lake Superior and Great Lakes could form what was called a naval militia. Well, he was the kind of guy that had uh, attracted and so he uh, developed a company from Washburn Natives into the Washburn Naval Militia. And their big job, they really only had one, was one ship that was ever built in Washburn, Wisconsin, was during his tenure as the commander of the Naval Militia Company. And so he got to christen that ship. And when he christened the ship, he had apparently talked longer than I have now. And that's, uh, but he did say something to the effect of, well, I better quit now because this ship is hanging on the chocks by a thread. Well, the workers went up and they knocked the chocks out from the runners and the ship didn't move. <laughs> and they pushed on the ship and they did other things and the ship didn't move into the water. And so someone from the crowd says, you know what, find the congressperson, tell him to get over here and pull that down So, next slide. Uh, here's an example of the ad that's in the Washington paper, paper relative to his 25,000 acres of choice farmland. And uh, he was selling particularly to all of the Nordic farmers who were moving into Northern Wisconsin and into the cover order. Next slide. And here's an example that the yellow markings, this is washed along the Washington Bay View line. It's a little bit later, maybe um, late teens, but you can see that in those areas, the area that's marked in red and yellow, if you can tell it there, that is what lots of people from Washington would have known as TV Hill. Somebody who was selling land to farmers. 
And it's very likely that that's where he got his capital from to do that. The other answer would be that, and for a long time, a number of us thought this, that he was a great flip flap man. And he had just come up here and put an ad in the paper. And just when he got a customer, he bought the land that they wanted and they sold it to them. But I think the more accurate uh, expectation now is, is that the Haskell family underwrote under him. Now, interestingly, another tie to this Haskell name is the man, the chemist, responsible for all of the formulas that the DuPont company used to develop its uh, explosives in the early 19, uh, 20th century. He, his last name was Haskell as well. And in fact, his brother spent some time here in Washburn, built the, what I call the old Washburn Hospital um, for the chemists and some of the other employees of the DuPont plant in the early 20th century. And also moved on from Washburn, went to Minneapolis, set up uh, a green operation, hooked up with Jim Hunt, the great uh, rail baron, and Ken Waller, Washburn, the Washington, the Wisconsin governor, the Wisconsin senator, all of those kind of things. And uh, he was probably tied into PD as well. And interestingly enough, the first DuPont Young Men's Club in Washington was named the Haskell Club. It was named the Haskell Club in honor of this chemist who rose to be the executive vice president of DuPont Company. And it kept that name until the property that was on this location in 1917 burned to the ground. And uh, it was the old Sheridan building, but it was named the Haskell DuPont Young Mexico. And when DuPont rebuilt, 1918, and I won't spend much time on this, but when DuPont rebuilt in 1918, they turned the building over formally to the YMCA and ran it as a community YMCA. But behind the scenes, what people don't know about DuPont's interest in providing a young men's club going all the way back to 1910 is that Washburn was one of the communities that most avidly pushed prohibition. But the only thing that Washington could do was take away the licenses from the many taverns that ran up and down Bayfield Street. Because there was no law against drinking in your home, there was no law against having your home. And so they would find residences, or they would rent places, and they 
they would drink them in the residence, or they would drink them on the streets, and they would raise hell. And the businessman, like Dick Olson, he didn't want, he didn't want them raising hell in front of his place, or bust through the windows and those kind of things. So the Chamber of Commerce, then called the Commerce Club, got on everybody's back, including the managers at DuPont, and DuPont created a young men's club where they could play pool and get off the street, and if they were going to raise hell, it was going to be someplace where they weren't doing it on Main Street, Washington. So that's a side of our story about how the DuPont clubs came to be. Next slide, then. So, Washington County in 1912 that there were six candidates for aldermen and no candidate for mayor. So now we figure out how he got to be mayor so soon in 1912. He basically, a few days before the election, put his name in the hat and he was the only candidate. Well, Dick voted for him. One army. The British and the French controlled the agenda 
in Europe. And what they did was they broke Persian Zani into small, smaller groups and fed them into the lines amongst the French and amongst the British as battalions or regiments or something like that. So they ended up on the front lines actually at least one point were a group who um, climbed over the brokers and into no man's land, led by the cap. Next slide. Here. In June of 1918, he was relieved of his duty as captain of the company. The reason he had contracted malaria. Now, when I first read that, I scratched my head and I said, Malaria, isn't that kind of a subtropical disease? I had never heard of malaria uh, being something that is common across Europe or the northern countries or even in the United States. I decided I wanted to look at that to see if there was any truth to it. I found out that the US American soldiers in the First World War did sometimes contract malaria. How did that happen? Well, remember what I told you about how the French and the British inserted the American units into their armies to fill gaps. It is very likely that Pee's um, uh, company, given that he was in France along the line, ended up mixing with the French Army. Well, a lot of the French Army in 1917 and 1918, after most of the original French Army had been killed off, came from Morocco, came from Sudan, came from the, the French provinces, and they brought malaria with them to France and spread it with them. And PD contracted with malaria by being in contract with these French soldiers from the right of Africa. When he came back, he ended up at the hospital in Des Moines, Iowa, at the Army Hospital. Um, it was mostly a hospital for people who suffered, suffered from alcoholic type of disablements, but there's no evidence that, that anyone can point to to say that that's what he went through. It's much more likely that the accurate story is malaria. He was discharged in January of 1919. Next slide, Ooh, we got to keep moving on. That's a picture of the captain in uniform. Next slide. Another picture of the captain uh, with one of his mates. Next slide. United States Congress. So he came back, 1920. Nobody wanted to be married yet. He ran from there. He got to be there. The coffers were full. The war was just over. DuPont had a thousand workers at the time. All those connections. But the city was still poor. And um, uh, he and some of his mates got into trouble. Uh, people who were on the council who were PD type guys. Because they had to replace the boiler in the city um, uh, offices. And they didn't go through the normal, even then, bidding processes. They hired a competent uh, contractor, uh, a relative of one of the other persons, put the boiler in, transferred the money, and some of the citizens of Washington didn't like that, particularly the Washington Times. So they organized a recall of the mayor. Came down to 14 volts. PD kept his office by 14 volts. Uh, it's 1920, he decides to run for Congress, he loses, he's still the mayor. Comes 1922, he 
runs again, he wins a seat in Congress. The 11th District of Wisconsin is one of the biggest districts in the United States at the time, geographically. Um, uh, so he resigns and he turns the mayor's office over to a uh, gentleman by the name of Brian. And he's out of Washington, D.C. Next slide, and this one is where I want you to listen carefully because the woman who was his chief of staff and secretary is going to talk to us now about her experience of being on his staff as a congressperson. And that woman is none other than Elizabeth Cox. This painting occurred in about 1951 or 1952, uh, and uh, I uncovered it uh, somewhat uh, serendipitously um, at the uh, archives at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Uh, Okay, it doesn't it doesn't work with the woman, but it is a okay. it is a recording of this talking about her tenure. It, so for those of you who knew her, you will hear if this happens, you will hear her voice talking about her experience um, uh, working for him. Um, it's an exceptional piece of uh, uh, memorabilia for the city of Washington because. There are not many voices from that time that uh, we can still listen to or have captured. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, what we'll do is let's keep going because we do have a clock and we do have somebody following us. Uh, and um, uh, I don't want Coco to get me out of the room. Thank you. 
we have one last thing to do. Um, on January 12th of 2020, because this presentation was supposed to happen at Hokan uh, uh, last year, which was canceled. I was able, through some contacts, to January 12th be P's birthday, to have the American flag flown over the United States Capitol in his honor. And today, I'm going to present this flag to Judge Anderson. And Judge Anderson, uh, I understand, will have it placed on the wall of honor at the courthouse where the portrait of Elizabeth Hawks hangs and the portraits of the Beacon County Circuit Court judges hang. And John, if you would open it and take out the certificate, if we do we still have enough time, Carla? You can read the certificate and uh, it's a repeat of what I said and there's the flag. Uh, it flew over the House of Representatives the whole day on January 12th of 2020. We've got to do it for you. Yeah. And I'll turn this over to you. I'll put this for you soon. The architect, architect of the Capitol the flag of the United States of America is to certify that the accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol on January 12, 2020. The flag is flown in honor of the former Wisconsin Congressman Hubert H. Peavy. Congressman Peavy was born January 12, 1881. He is the only person in Washington, Wisconsin, a small town on the shores of Lake Superior in far northern Wisconsin, to have served in Congress in the Congress of the United States. The presentation of the life of Congressman Peavy was presented in August of 2020 as part of the Washington's 175 years homecoming celebration. The flag will be presented to the Wisconsin Circuit Court Judge John Anderson and will be permanently displayed at the Bacon County Courthouse in Washington, Wisconsin. I'm very proud to accept this. Joe, great presentation. You know, as we, as we wrap things up, as you can see, uh, Joel used his research skills uh, did a great job with this. Anybody in here today that owns any real estate in Bay Hill County, uh, in a very small way, has a debt of gratitude to people like HHP. And I'll tell you why. Because in a long scope of history, things have a weird way of working their way back to how things in the past affect you today. You see, people like Peavy and people like the family of Spray that own a lot of the land and the Washburn Land Company and the Maxi Land Company, they were kind of small players in the big company, but they own a lot of land. Now, they, they weren't on the same scale as the Rust Bowl and Lumber Company or the Warehouser Company or Consolidated Paper, which owned enormous tracts of land in the big company. But these small operations, when I say small, they each owned thousands of acres. The Bayfield Investment Company owned Bethany Story all itself about who the Bayfield Investment Company ever was, or the American Immigration Company. I have no idea what they were. But they owned a ton of land. But you see, when the cover was done and the land went, uh, the value of it decreased. And during the 1920s, Washington Bayfield County lost. 20% of our population. It was a tough time. And in some respects, they were probably never recovered from it. But all that land had a lot of tax. And while the land didn't have any timber value at the time, the, the, the trees were starting to be populated at that point. And the county owned it. If you look at a flat book today, you'll see the national forest. Uh, throughout the whole center of the, of the county, but then you'll see on the edges of the National Forest there are huge tracts of land owned by the Bayfield County. And through wise management 
Um, uh, I knew so for a while 
recently lost in 34 was that back in 20 or 30 was when the Fallets split off from the Republicans and established the Progressive Party here in Wisconsin. Petey did not join him in that move, even though Petey and the Fallet were fairly close. And it is likely that with the Washington Times being a Catholic Republican organization, more traditional Republicans, 